Welcome to another episode of the No Ceilings Podcast. I am Tyler Metcalf, joined, as always, by Tyler Rucker. Rucker, we did it. The draft is coming gone. How are we feeling? Metcalf, I, I, I missed you. I'm going to just start that. I missed everybody. This felt, I don't know why, it's only been like less than a week, and uh, I feel like I haven't been on this podcast in like two months. It's unbelievable. I feel like Tom Hanks in uh, Castaway yelling at Wilson. I'm feeling good. Um, I have a big void every morning of like, wait, it's 5 a.m. I need to watch film. And now I'm like, wait, I have time off. What's What do I fill this with? So how are we feeling, Metcalf? I'm very excited the draft's over, but I'm excited to finally talk about it with yourself. We haven't really uh, bro- broken it down since uh, the long stream and I'm still recovering. So how, how are you doing, my, my kind sir? I'm I'm fantastic. Uh, like you said, I have all this newfound time, and I don't know what to do with it. I I fi- find myself procrastinating somehow even more, um, <laughs> even though I have less to do now, which is a, a weird conundrum. Um, hey, have you found any new projects or conquests that you're that that you're taking over that you're diving into? Uh, personally, I have found these awesome things called uh, TV shows and books that I've uh, started diving back into. And that's been a, a great experience. Um, I, I highly recommend both. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. I'm uh, I'm about to dive in and get some books rolling out. I'm, I'm actually pretty pumped about that. I'm finally getting back in the gym. And for everyone laughing, um, I had to get no ceilings rolling the way that it deserves. So there wasn't a lot of t- hours available on my schedule. So now that I'm Going back into the gym every day. I think I've gone like three days straight. I feel like Rocky getting prepared to fight Drago. <laughs> so um, that's feeling really good. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that next year that's part of my daily uh, routine when the draft grind is getting crazy. But yeah, feeling good. Um, also about to get my golf game back, Metcalf. So Oof, that's going to be a brutal couple <laughs> months. But, you know, like I said, the, the offseason's for projects. Um, really excited for, for free agency to start soon. But I also just weirdly have like, I have the desire to watch film now and I've never had this. This is what the no ceilings crew has done for me. So like the other day I was up at like five and I was like, what's wrong with me? Sleep in like the draft's <laughs> over. And I was like, what am I going to do? And then I just put on like FIBA Victor versus Chet. And I was oh. like, why not? And then I realized everyone's just in that game. And I was like, this is great. I should keep doing this all the time. <laughs> Oh man, I, I have a problem now. I'm addicted to draft film. I, I I used it as a joke before, but now it's just really crazy. But not, not, now it's quickly becoming a real life problem. <laughs> it's a um, problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to tr- tr- try and cure some of that fix, yeah. Um, you know, we, we got to react to the draft. I know everyone's done it. There was some spur of the moment stuff. Um, we, you know, we tweeted about it. We wrote about it. But we've had a few days to process everything right now. So. Stuff has kind of settled in, um, been able to make more sense of it, been able to be more confused by some moves. So where do you want to start when you think about the 2022 draft? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Should we just start with with Paulo Mania or do you want to I'll give you should we do the magic or the Knicks? What do you want to do? Do you want to get the Knicks over with or do you want to no, save no, that let, for later? Let, yeah, let's save that. I mean, Thank I, you. That was a test and you passed. <laughs> Let's talk about the Magic, because we all thought they were going to take Jabari, and I think they made the right pick. Yeah. I don't know what you think. Let me me hear it, Metcalf. We we haven't talked about any of the drafts one-on-one, so this is going to be a very exciting episode. Yeah. um, So I I did end up with Paolo at three on my personal board, but I thought he made so much more sense at that spot than Jabari did, and I thought that from lottery night and... I never really understood why Jabari was the supposed lock at number one. And that's not to throw shade at Jabari. I think he's an incredible, incredible player. I think Houston got incredibly lucky with whoever would have fallen to them. So this isn't an indictment on Jabari as a player. More so what Orlando needed 
was an offensive hub. They needed someone who could get his own shot anywhere on the floor. They needed someone who could play, make, and create for others, someone to attract gravity and be efficient with their decision-making, their scoring, their playmaking. And that's exactly what Paulo is. And I think he's going to be able to provide that pretty quickly in his career. And then you just think about the, the forward pairing with like him and Franz or Jonathan Isaac, if he ever comes back and is healthy. Um, there's just a lot of really interesting um, lineup combinations that they can put together. And then defensively, I think Wendell Carter is going to cover up a lot. Um, I think the foot speed is going to be a little lacking there um, for those two in particular, but a lot of the bruising, a lot of the rim protection, I think Wendell's going to be able to cover up a lot of the shortcomings that Paulo has in his game. When we talked about Paulo going to Houston, one of the the things that we just us and you know everyone else in the draft community kept talking about was, God, just imagine how much fun this Jalen Green Paulo pick and roll is going to be. Obviously, I think it's good. That would have been fantastic. I think the Jabari Jalen Green pick and pick and pop situations are going to be a lot of fun too. But I think the Jalen Suggs Paulo pick and roll is going to be a lot of fun as well. Maybe a little less so immediately, but I think Paulo is going to help everyone on that team get better because he's going to make their offensive roles and responsibilities so much more simple. Yeah. I mean, we at no ceilings were projecting that Jabari was going to go one. We were buying into the noise and the rumblings we had heard from around the league and you know, if you if you listen or, or see some of the pieces we wrote, we were still sh- like, why wouldn't they take Paulo? Like, this is yeah. Paulo. What is what they need? And we even said, why wouldn't they take Chet? I love that Paulo ended up there because that's exactly what the Magic have needed. They've needed a guy you can hand the ball and be like, we need you to get a, a bucket for us. And and Paulo has that ability in his game, absolutely a hundred percent. I agree with you. I think people are sleeping on the idea of, of Suggs and Paulo running pick and rolls and. And Cole Anthony and, and yeah. Paulo, like that's an intriguing mixture right there. There's some quickness. There's some electricity. So you're adding Paulo now. Um, I still believe Wendell Carter is going to have another, like he had a great season last year. I think he's going to have another step forward. I think Orlando loves him. He's shown that he's got the upside still. Um, I thought, you know, it just didn't work out in Chicago, but I was like, someone go get Wendell Carter. He's going to be fine. And, and I think maybe he has found a home in Orlando. And then Franz, another year. And, and they got your boy Caleb Houston in the second round, mm-hmm. who I still think that's great value because he's not yep. going to be rushed. Um, Caleb Houston can impact the game without scoring. Like, he's going to be a nice rotation piece. So, it's a big night for Orlando. They're, they're, they were on the right path. Um, hat tip to that front office for staying quiet and getting their guy, identifying them in the beginning. And, you know, Paulo had reportedly kept pushing his his workouts with the Magic down the road because yeah. he was like, I'm not going here. You guys aren't going to draft me. And and they still said, we don't care. This is our guy. This is who we've wanted the whole time. So it was a stealth mission. I, I loved it. You know, it was absolutely awesome. So real quickly before we move off Orlando, yeah. um, I, I just want to talk, talk or at least mention Caleb Houston. Because as the first round wound down, uh, all of my conspiracy theories quickly got disproven um, in just rapid fashion. Just really excellent stuff by me. Um, (laughs) Were you surprised that Orlando was the place that he ended up? Did you like that pick where you're just like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, What what was your reaction to Caleb Houston, you know, going in in the second round, but just outside of the first after being super quiet, not really working out for anyone and denying the combine invite? I, I, it's always interesting because we can connect the dots right now, but you might find out some information in in a couple weeks, you know, like summer leagues coming around the corner. You could find out why Caleb Houston went in the second round, or um, you could also find out something like, Hey, he he reportedly had a report or a promise, but it didn't happen, which happens a lot. Like just because you get a promise doesn't mean you get drafted. Like we've seen it time and time again. I thought him landing in Orlando was best for him because he's not going to be asked to do a lot right away. He's got so much upside. Me and you've talked about him all year, Metcalf, like on this podcast and, and off the air, Caleb could be one of those second round guys that really clicks and, and he's going to a place that 
If he clicks for Orlando, that is a heck of a piece to help them take the next step forward. They have some really good talent on that roster. They just need like that, that wild card that really clicks. Like if mm-hmm. Paulo clicks and you know, he's going to be a guy that's potentially a, a favorite for rookie of the year, just because of the numbers he might put up. But if Paulo clicks and then all of a sudden Caleb Houston's like a outstanding seventh or eighth guy in your rotation. Now you're building something with Orlando and Franz takes the step and Suggs takes the step and Wendell Carter is exactly what it is. I'm excited for magic fans. I I think you got something special. Um, You mentioned earlier, like Jonathan Isaac, Markel Fultz, like they have some stuff. Maybe there's some more moves to to be made this off season. You never know, but um, they're also going to have crazy cap space. I think it's next summer. They're setting up to have just, cuckoo money so things are looking up for orlando but um yeah i was i was pumped for caleb houston going there what about you yeah and uh, everything you just said he's not going to be asked to do anything early in his career uh the more you know he's one of those guys where on draft day i was just like let me just throw on a little bit of caleb houston film for the heck of it and i was like god this dude just really understands how to play he moves so well without the ball he attacks closeouts he runs hard off screens he runs well in transition he's a good passer the shot just didn't fall and it's gonna have to fall for him in the nba because if it doesn't he's not the athlete he's not a good enough athlete where he can you know really compensate in other ways but if that shot does start falling that's when attacking the closeouts and that ball movement that's when it really starts to become more of a legitimate weapon so he's gonna have to shoot it but i think he's in a good spot where he's gonna be they're gonna be patient uh hopefully and just let him kind of find his footing and come along because he was one of the top high school recruits for a reason and you know, I, I really hope that he's able to find refine that shot and kind of show what made him such a promising uh, prospect coming out of high school. Yeah, I mean, Franz was going nuclear from downtown last year as a rookie. Um, so if that can happen, maybe Orlando has the best shooting coaches in the entire world. So, you know, we never know. But I, I love the value. I thought getting Paul at one, who I still thought was probably – the best fit for them. And it's nothing against Jabari Smith. I just thought that idea of getting Paulo is exactly what Orlando needed. And then getting Caleb Houston is is great value in the second round. So heck of a draft for for them. You you couldn't have planned it any better. All right, Metcalf, I'm letting you pick. What do you want to talk about? Um, Well, I, I I don't want to go pick by pick, but while we're still at the top of the draft, I, I think it makes sense to just talk about OKC and Houston. Yeah. Both of whose drafts I really, really liked. Um, I mean, OKC clearly has their type where it's guys with extraordinary length who have a ton of upside and can do a bit of a lot of things and guys with really high feel and passing abilities. And I think that was really highlighted with both the Jalen Williams picks those are two guys who can do a bit of everything on offense are really intelligent with how the floor is spaced and where guys are. Their floor awareness was some of the more impressive in this class. Uh, their passing, especially for their positions was really impressive. And then just take, being able to take the home run swing on Usman Jang, um, who I think is going to be a disaster as a rookie, but it's not going to deter me from my long-term thoughts about him and then Chet who I had as the best player in this draft. Um, I, I don't think they could have done any better. And then with Houston, I, I loved what they did. Their biggest issue as a team last year was that they couldn't defend anyone on the perimeter and got teams would just get to the rim at will Jabari Smith and Tari Eason are going to help fix that immediately. And I think three, four years from now, that defensive pairing could be one of the nastier ones in the NBA. And then you get awesome value with Ty Ty at 29. It's a team that needs a point guard. Um, I was surprised Ty Ty fell that far, but I think he's a good shooter, good pick and roll operator, and can just be a steadying presence for that team in the long run who can play a little bit on or off ball. So I, I thought what both those teams did made a lot of sense and really kind of showed you what they value and what they saw as huge needs for their teams. I, I love what both of them are doing. I, I, I thought both organizations hit an absolute home run when, when it comes to this. And, and this is what they've been doing um, over the last couple of years. 
to start with, I'm going to start with Houston because I, I think Houston, Houston deserves a little bit more credit in this draft than they might have gotten in the national spotlight, if that makes sense. Cause I think everyone's going to talk about Detroit, which we'll talk about later. And I think everyone's going to focus on OKC, which thunder up. They had a heck of a draft, but I love what Houston's doing in these last two drafts. Like Raphael stone's doing a great job. This is how you rebuild. So, you know, last draft, he gets Josh Christopher, he gets Shangun, he gets Jalen green, he gets Garuba. Those are just you're not going to hit on every draft pick, but you got to throw darts if you're rebuilding. You got to just throw some darts at the board. This draft, he he identifies what this team needs. So he gets Jabari at three. Now we thought it was going to be Paulo, but he gets Jabari at three, which I still love. Yes, that fit because me and you have talked. Like, yeah, everyone loves Jabari's offensive upside, but the defensive upside is what it's perfect for Houston. Like, if you're a Rockets fan and you're not wanting to admit it, but you're a little bummed that you didn't get Paulo because you were just hyping yourself up for months. You're going to be okay because Jabari's defense is exactly what the Rockets need. Like he has potential to be the best player from this draft because of that yeah. upside on both sides of the ball. But then Houston just does a great job now of, of letting the value come to them and identifying not just drafting for needs, but also seeing like, this is what we need. But also, this is the upside, the best player available. Tari Eason at 17 was great. Um, 29, they get Ty Ty, who I still think that's fantastic yeah. value for them. And, and then, you know, it's just exactly, you're, you're creating this depth now where it's like, if you don't hit on every player, you still got the shot to, if one of these wild ones hits, like if Ty Ty all of a sudden became a star, you, now your team's really looking nasty and you have all this youth to develop and groom. They're going to be fun, Metcalf. Yeah. Like they might still be like a team that struggles in the West because there's so many good teams, but they're going to be fun to watch develop. Like I'm very excited to watch the Rockets. Um, okay. See, just <laughs> press these an animal. <laughs> like, I, I absolutely love their draft because this is, Everyone always thinks Presti's going to like package all these picks to trade for a superstar, but I think he's doing he's doing the route. And, and I was listening to Bill Simmons and Rosillo, and and I think it was Rosillo brought this up, and I was like, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't have said it better. Presti's kind of in this mindset of like, no, we're just going to throw these chances at these guys in the draft, and if one of them clicks, then awesome. And and I think Presti he got. Chet to be potentially like the fill the franchise building block. And I'm SGA. I love you. I'm just saying like where you could add assets around that big man presence. Mm -hmm. He gets Jang for the upside, crazy skills swing. And then he gets Jalen Williams, Santa Clara, Jalen Williams at 12. I think it was at 12. Yes. Um, also shout out to Jalen for the Instagram tag with the hoodie. We appreciate it. Friend of the program. Absolutely. And then um, they get Metcalf's favorite player in the whole draft, Jalen Williams of Arkansas, the second round. But being serious on that one, I actually liked that pick. Yeah, because so it was I. like, when you add him after the three other picks, there's another upside swing. And, and I love what Pressy's doing. I love what the Raphael Stone's doing with the Rockets. I think that's, you got to build through the draft. If you're a team like that, you got to build through the draft. And they're doing such a good job. So... Um, that was my rant. Now you got me <laughs> fucking fired up, folks. Welcome back. We ain't going anywhere. Well, so you, you you say that you have to build through the draft, but the Phoenix Suns would apparently vehemently disagree. Even I though, understand, but Chris even Paul though two also of their best players, <laughs> they got through the draft, and their other two best. Hmm, weird. Definitely not just a cheap franchise, though. It, that that's definitely not the reason. But okay, uh, uh, next place we have to go is my favorite draft. Oh, wow, by anyone. Um, the Detroit Pistons, yeah, what okay. they did, it was, perfect. No, it was perfect, it was perfect, perfect. So, they, they, they are very quickly reigniting my early 2000s fandom, uh, for them. That it started with Cade, and I was like, okay, perfect, you have the number one pick, you take the best player, this makes a lot of sense. Um, awesome, love it. But how you build around that is going to tell, or, you know, show a lot of what they 
are capable of. And I thought the pieces that they put it, that they brought in were absolutely perfect. The fact that Jade and Ivy fell to five for them was a dream come true. Trading up for Duran, I thought was absolutely perfect. Just a great infusion of athleticism and potential and youth into their front court. Um, and now they're not going to be hamstrung by giving a max to DeAndre Ayton. I think DeAndre Ayton's a great player, but for how where this Pistons team is, being committed to that much money this quickly, yes. I think would really derail a lot of the things that they want to do or would be capable yes. of doing in the future. And now Duran solves that. <laughs> and then they got our boy, Gabriel Prochita, in the second yeah. round. I mean, just incredible value. Just I mean, w- walked away with three of my top 18 players in this draft. And they addressed athleticism. They addressed youth. They addressed depth. Um, for Pistons fans who, for some reason, think Jaden Ivey can only succeed on ball, he cannot. Uh, he was telling NBA teams that he views himself as a shooting guard, that he grew up playing shooting guard, that he's always played shooting guard. Uh, shooting guards are not point guards, um, so they do not have the ball all the time. And we just spent the last two years watching Jaden Ivey be pretty successful off the ball. The on-ball stuff obviously gives credence to the insane potential that he has, but his ability to play off ball is what makes him so attractive next to a guy like Cade and neither Ivy nor Duran have ever played with a guy as creative or with someone who can control and completely manipulate every facet of the game. Like Kate Cunningham has, I, I just absolutely love the team that they're building. It's it's, it it was just awesome. Like watching it. I was just like, that is how you draft. Like that is how you be a Gia and, this could all blow up. I I don't think it's going to, and I don't care if people play this back in a couple of years, but Troy Weaver is, is I said it on Nathan's podcast with draft deeper. I was like, he's becoming Hannibal Lecter on draft night where he's just like four moves ahead. And I love the fact that he got Ivy at five and any team in the NBA that got him at that spot would have just been like, poof, what a night we got our guy at five. And Weaver just said, fuck it. I'm not done. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to go get my other guy that I love. I'm going to go get Jalen Duran. And I thought this is perfect for Duran because yeah. he's going to go somewhere where he doesn't have to be the guy right away. Cause he's, if you haven't heard, he's going to be 18 years old when he plays Wait, his he's, first NBA game. He's oh young. Wow. He should have been going, he should have been getting ready for his freshman year of college. Um, huh. Who would have thought? Duran and Isaiah Stewart. I'm like, you met Calf like, I understand the upside and the intrigue and maybe they shock us and they still try to go get Aiton. I don't think that's happening. No. I think there's, there's so much more benefit of being patient with the rebuild because if you try to speed it up, you could completely derail it. Like if they try to give Aiton all this money and I love Aiton, I, I'm yes. a big Aiton supporter, but then you lock up that potential cap space because you're giving out that money. Now it's like, you got some, interesting couple of weeks with with free agency like what what moves do you strategically bring in maybe they try to get a wing maybe they try to add a couple rotation pieces detroit's on the right path they're they're doing a fantastic job of of adding the necessary pieces to the puzzle to get back to not just making the playoffs to contending each and every year now um they're going to they got lucky with Cade. I'm, I'm just saying like, it takes luck to get the first pick yes. and Cade yeah. now looks like a superstar. Um, I'm very excited. They, they skyrocketed up my, my league pass rankings for next year because Isaiah Stewart, Sadiq Bay, Jalen Duran, kind of bringing him along slowly and Ivy and Cade are going to be awesome to watch together. So I love what they're doing. And, and you know, the Italian Stalin, Gabriel Prochita, just, you know, going to the Motor City it sounds like a it sounds like a movie franchise. I I, I might have to get a Prochita jersey. It, oh it's God, it's it a pretty good one. If if he makes the roster is in the rotation as a rookie this year, I'm gonna be like, oh gosh, I haven't bought a jersey in five years, but that <laughs> so, might be the same. one I get. It just I, I, I don't it. I don't have a single jersey in my closet, <laughs> but that 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 might be the one. Kate, I love you. Ivy, I love you. Duran, I love you. But oof, a, a, a nice little Prochita jersey. Mm. It's tempting. 
but the fact that they were able to trade up, I, I forget the exact details, but I think is basically their trade up to get Duran was basically just taking on Kemba Walker's salary, which they freed up a ton of space with the Jeremy Grant move. And then moving that first round pick via Milwaukee that they got in that Jeremy Grant move, moving that out. I think that was it was, or there may have been a second round pick too, but to get your franchise or your future franchise center for just that, it's incredible, incredible work by Troy Weaver. Yeah. And and you're not drafting Duran to be Aiden. Like you're not, Duran does not need to be a, a, 18 and 11 guy because nope. there, there's going to be so many much talent around him. And I think I'm not saying Duran's never going to be like that level type of player, but I'm saying he just needs to be a, a rim protecting muscle down low that can play great defense and be a nuclear lob threat. And, and that's exactly what Duran can do right now. And um, I love the fit for him because if he could just be, a solid starting center with all those pieces around him, they're going to score. Like they're, they're going to put up plenty of points down the road when, when all those guys are cooking. I'm not saying just this year, but I'm saying in the future. So I love the fit for Durant. I was fascinated to see where he ended up. And, and when Detroit got him, I was like, Woo, I love that fit for him. So, um, and you know, like Isaiah Stewart is going to, have Duran running through a damn brick wall. So I, I'm not worried about that lineup. I mean, man, I, I, I just loved what Detroit did. And I'm like you, Metcalf, like sign me up for a Prochita jersey. That's what we need is a Prochita t-shirt. Like if they get like a, maybe we just, we'll make them ourselves and sell yeah, there them we on go. the ceilings. Thank you. There, Corey, there get on it. That, that, that's that big brain thinking. <laughs> All right. Uh, where do you want to go next? Can we, can I... Can I say thank you to one team and then we can move on? Sure. Thank you to Michael Jordan and the Charlotte Hornets for taking Mark Williams. We spoke it into existence, Metcalf. I'm so proud. I, I, I've watched all of the press conference videos. I, I, I can barely hold myself. There's another jersey I might get. Just put a Mark <laughs> Williams one up right next to it. Oh, I'm so pumped. Just so pumped that they got him. It, it made you? too much sense. I mean, yeah, it did. He's exactly what they needed. Um, I, I think he's even he's going to be he's going to surprise a lot of people with how much he runs with their transition offense. Yes, um, I mean, can move a little perplexed by the Steve Clifford rehire. I like Steve Clifford as a coach, but um, yeah, can we talk about that? Oh yeah, my gosh, but, let's let's sprinkle in some NBA talk in here. We don't have to do only draft stuff. Spoiler alert, folks. We're probably going to be talking about the NBA a lot more next year. There's your hint. So, um. Steve Clifford. Interesting. Yeah, they they went back to him. Is it like going back to your ex-girlfriend? Because you're like, yeah, she was great. I just kind of didn't read the room the right way. Um, It feels like going back to your, like, two exes ago. Like, oh, no. D'Antoni was, you know, the ex because they chose Atkinson over him. And then I'm sure that they went back to him and he's like, Oh, my price just went up a couple million. And they're like, "Mm, crap. All right. Hey, Steve, you want to come back? Hey buddy, we miss you. Please come home. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It it was very weird. Why they didn't just go, why they didn't pursue like a younger head coach, like the Utah jazz kind of did some, you know, an assistant, um, I don't know. It was it was just a weird, weird situation there. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible because I, I was just convinced that they were going to hire D'Antoni in the beginning. Then they didn't hire him, and I was like, dang it. I was like, in a weird, selfish way, I wanted to see LaMelo and D'Antoni just saying, screw it, let's try to break the high score every game. And then Atkinson backs out, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to get to Antoni. This is going to be crazy. Like, league pass is going to be erotic next year. And then I saw the Clifford thing, and I was like, oh, cool. They hired Clifford as assistant. And then I was like, to be a head coach. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not ready for this. NBA offseason, calm down. Shocking. It was shocking. I don't know. Yeah, that's all I got. But, hey, it might work out. I feel like Clifford's a big first-year guy. 
So maybe they're just trying to, I don't know, Metcalf. I don't know. I, I don't got any good jokes. I don't I, got any I, good I, jokes about that. I, he, he's the anti Dan Tony. Um, so <laughs> I, I, it, it made no sense to me. Um, but something else that also shocked me on draft night was the EJ Liddell fall. Um, yeah, I was heartbroken when my Timberwolves passed on him, what seemed like an infinite amount of times. Um, they even traded up back up in the first round and then still didn't take him. Uh, and then s- traded away multiple second round picks, uh, as he continued to fall. What happened? I love the fit in new Orleans. I think that's just incredibly unfair that I think the team they're building is going to be a nightmare for opponents to deal with down there next year. What happened? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's, it's the one that when I start asking around, it's probably at summer league, I'll start, you know, I'll start basically demanding answers from everyone <laughs> that's walks around the gym. I'll be like, what was it? You know, I feel like it'll be like Batman. Be Where's the trigger? Um, I, I, I still can't figure it out because I just – I understand he's undersized. I understand some people might have been like, eh, I don't know if he could fit with us, but I thought some team was going to just take a gamble because um seemed like a guy that was interviewing well. I feel like there was good intel about him. And, man, New Orleans, what a haul. That's the, that's the haul that I don't know if they're going to get enough attention as they deserve, but – you talk about that team just adding Dyson Daniels and EJ Liddell. EJ off the bench. Oh, woo. I love, I love what, like exactly what you said, Metcalf. I love that roster they're building. They, they're they going to have some crazy cuckoo talent. So I don't know. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. Um, at one point I was screaming like Celtics, just go up and fucking take them. Like, come on. Like, I don't care. Let's get another big that could shoot threes but hey i don't know man i'm shocked what about you i it made no sense to me um i he's the absolute perfect fit with the timberwolves um and i think he's a guy who has starter upside and i he's going i really think he's going to vastly outperform his draft spot uh because he can do a bit of everything uh, my guess is that teams weren't buying the shooting improvement from an older prospect. And I'm guessing that they viewed him as kind of too small to play center and not necessarily fast enough or quick enough to defend on the perimeter. So that that would be my guess. But I feel like every draft, when those guys fall, every team regrets it because they just continue to outperform because of how many different things they do. I think his path to playing time might be a little tough given, you know, Zion and Herb Jones and some of the other guys that they're building out on that roster, but he provides so much and whatever you need him to do, he's one of these guys that can do it. And that really mirrors, you know, their first round pick in Dyson Daniels too, mm-hmm. who I think is just the perfect, you know, po- point guard fit on that team to play alongside Ingram and Zion and CJ where those guys are going to have the ball the vast majority of the time. And Dyson's still going to be able to make a positive offensive impact because he's such a good connector and passer and can attack closeouts and rotations and get to the rim and get his points that way. He doesn't need the ball to score. And with their shooting coach, Fred Vinson, that's exactly where I would want him to go to improve that shot that I think still needs a lot of work because it takes a decade to get off his hand. So I love that fit. I think their defense is going to be really nasty next year. Um, what what were your thoughts on Dyson falling there? I thought that was the best spot for both parties. Like going into the draft, I was like, man, and Dyson might be going seven. And then I thought, you know, I don't think Portland's going to go that route. I think they're, I think the sharp love is real. And I was like, man, Dyson would just be there for New Orleans. And I would love that fit because now this roster is really just building a lot of weapons all over where it's like, you know, they have CJ, they have Ingram. If Zion's healthy, my goodness. Then they, they have like all of these players all over the place herb jones i think trey murphy's gonna have a humongous year for yep. that team and be such a weapon um 
I just really, really like what they're doing. And, and then you throw Dyson Daniels in there who early on, all he's got to do is just be a smart decision maker, a playmaker and defend his butt off. He can do all of those and, and it's going to be fun. This team is just rolling now. This team has some serious buzz. I also was shocked hearing that they're 60 to one to win the title next year. Cause I was like, excuse me, I might throw the, Holy crap bet on that just to have some fun. Um, Metcalf, while we're we're on the air, Woj Bomb, did you see it? I did not. Tarian Prince, two-year extension with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Your no. thoughts? I like 16 Torian. years he... total. Or 16 million total. Two years. <laughs> 16 years. Oh my 16 God. <laughs> years bringing back the death <laughs> contracts of just being like, pay me forever. Uh, two years, $16 million contract extension. I, I like it. Um, okay, good. He, he got off to a slow start last year, but really kind of found his footing once the shot started falling, uh, was good defensively. Um, he was just a nice kind of change of pace piece off the bench. And, you know, I, I hate to, you know, automatically say after a guy resigns that that's a good trade chip, but that $8 million salary is that yearly salary. That's in that kind of rare range of guys that we don't really see a whole lot, but they add so much to trades where it makes matching salaries a lot easier and they're a little easier to move, especially on the shorter term. So um, I think it makes sense from that standpoint, if they add him to a deal that, you know, hypothetically might include DeJounte Murray, or if they, you know, just roll with him because he, in the second half of the year, he really kind of found his, found his rhythm and was a really important piece to that team down the stretch. Yeah, just wanted to, you know, I just want to make sure you're happy because when you're happy, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> who else you got? What, what else What else are you thinking? Um, okay, so I we, we said before that we weren't going to do draft grades because it's... No, they suck. Because we, we don't know, obviously. Um, and we were also going to try to avoid doing winners and losers because, again, we don't know. All of these reactions are just based on our evaluations before, and mm-hmm. that could change. However... I am going to say a loser, and I think it is overtime elite. Um, yes. Not yes. having a single guy drafted, I think, is a tough look for them. They, I, you know, I think they probably have two top 10 locks next year in the Thompson Twins. And yes. listeners, if you haven't watched them, good Lord, go check out their highlight tape because they are fun. Um, they're, they're 50% athleticism is most people's hundred percent. They, they are freaky, but, and I'm sure there's a lot of kind of agent negotiation and manipulation going on here. Once they kind of got the general range of where their guys are going, but not having John Montero, who was a top 20 guy at most places preseason, uh, go completely undrafted and end up on a two way. And then Barlow, who was getting some buzz, it didn't surprise me that he went undrafted. Um, but I think having both those guys not have their name called on draft night is a tough look for overtime elite. Yeah. Tough, 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 just, just tough. You know, um, it, it definitely you, you wanted to see, I hate when it happens to the guys that gamble for the first year, like for Montero, I was like, we had him lower on our boards. We talked about him, but still not getting drafted. I was like, boy, that sucks. Because mm-hmm. then you bring in the argument of like, okay, if, if he stayed in Europe, what if he have gotten drafted for sure? Probably. Um, probably. And it's, it's becoming an ugly tradition that I think fans are going to need to pay more attention to moving forward is like, if this stuff all starts happening, like the like Peyton Watson was a potential lottery pick, barely plays at UCLA, still goes 30th. John Montero was really buzzing overseas, goes to play the overtime elite and doesn't get drafted. But there's also like Shaden Sharp doesn't play a game, gets drafted in the top 10. So our guy's going to be saying like, I'm just sitting out the year. Because mm-hmm. you could say that about Patrick Baldwin. You could have said that about Jaden Hardy. I don't know. I, I still think it's a it's a rough road but it's something to pay attention to down the road um i definitely thought you know 
I thought Barlow was going to get drafted. Um, yeah. He was just a popular name heating up throughout the last couple of weeks where I was like, wow, okay. Like he's really getting some steam. I don't know, Metcalf. I do know the Thompson twins are, gosh, those are guys are going to be fun next <sighs> we're year. Gonna I mean, we're going to talk about them a lot. Yes. We're going to be talking about them a lot. Um, you know, they got a shot to be two top five picks and, and I'm excited. I think we're going to try to go see them next year. Spoiler alert. I think a lot of people are going to go see them next year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was just a tough night for them. And I'm like you, I hate doing draft grades because I think they're stupid because you got to wait a couple of years to see how guys pan out. So I could give a guy a C right now and he could turn into a superstar in the league. And it's like, why am I giving him a grade right now? Like I hated grades in school. I still hate them now. Like let's, let's get away from that. Um, <laughs> so so what, what did you think of both those guys' landing spots, though, while, while we're on it? So Barlow signed a two-way with the Spurs, which I really like that for him. Yes. I think that's perfect for him. And then Montero signed a two-way with the Knicks, which theoretically I think could be really good for him. Um, but I'm a little more hesitant on. I, I thought it was Montero landing with the Knicks was probably the best for both parties, if that makes sense. I just thought, like it's a need and um, Ontario has the skills. He has the yes. talent. He just needs to land in the right spot. And, I think and he needs some needed, direction. Yes. And, and I think he landed in a good spot, um, especially with the Knicks. And, and it's not a guy that can't shock us and go crazy in the summer league. Like those are guys are going to be motivated. I loved Barlow ending up with the Spurs. Yeah. I thought that was great for, for him. And, there's a lot of guys around the NBA that were high on him um, heading into the draft. So I think that's notable that he landed with the Spurs because they're not going to be afraid to say, Hey, we got a plan for you. You know, we know you went undrafted, but we got a plan. Like we're going to develop you and, and maybe spend some time in the G league and really hits his stride. And then all of a sudden he finds himself on that roster and in the rotation at some point. But I thought it was good. What about you? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was fine. I, I think he just needs direction. Um, he the 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 talent is obvious. It just kind of felt during that whole overtime elite experience that yeah. he didn't really know what to do with it or wasn't really kind of given a direction on how to play. Hopefully, that changes in New York because the, the talent's there. Um, it's just got to kind of be reined in and appropriated to the you know, right areas of his game. What, what did you think of the rest of the next night? Here, here we go. Um, I was really excited to talk about this with you because I still can't really wrap my head around what I, I'm trying to be polite, <laughs> trying to be polite. I, I it's got, it's like an incomplete feeling because I have to see like in two weeks, I'm going to have a feeling, but I, now they're rumbling is that Brunson's going there. And so was this, was this all for Brunson? Because they're still going to have to, with the reported numbers, it sounds like they're still going to have to move some pieces. So was that all just to unload Kemba's contract? I don't love it, but I have. Do you know the protections off the top of your head? Oh God, I think they're really complicated. Um, I don't. Great, which is always a great. No, but see, that's my point right away. If they're really complicated, then I excuse my French. I fucking hate this trade. If it's yeah. really complicated, like you, you, you basically. I understood when they trade traded back last year because they kept getting some nice pieces. They got some good value, and I was fine with that. But this year you're you're in a sweet spot, and I was like, you got to add a piece there. Now, if you didn't love the board, I understand it, but I it just is brutal because I'm like, are you doing this all to get Brunson, who I love, I love Jalen Brunson, but you're getting this to basically say like, we're finally going to solve our point guard problem, and and I'm also thinking to myself like okay if you get Brunson what else yeah like this Brunson's not the only thing holding this Knicks team back they got a lot of stuff they need to fix and 
I just I, I'd love to see the Knicks build through the draft and, and I thought they were in a good spot this year to potentially do that and then just getting kind of rid of that pick for I know it's three future picks that's a big deal but mm-hmm. what if you only get one of them and what if one of them's late in the draft like so you just kind of kick the can down the line I don't know Metcalf tell me tell me what you feel try to make some sense of it yeah so I not I'm just on, I, I pulled up the kind of pick protections. So is a 2023 first from Dallas, which is okay. top 10 protected next year. Uh, that's the big 10, pick they have, right? That, that That's the one that will probably convey next year for sure. Um, that's top 10 protected uh, in 2023, 2024, 2025. Um, I would expect it to convey by then, but if it doesn't, it becomes a second round pick. Uh, the pick from Detroit is next year is top 18 protected. And then in both 2023 and 2024, and then top 13 protected in 25, top 11 in 26, uh, top nine in 27. And then it becomes a second round pick if they haven't done it by then, which hopefully they will. Um, And then the other one is Washington's 2023 first round pick, which is lottery protected in 23, top 12 protected in 24, top 10 protected in 25, and top eight protected in 26. So it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of speculation. Um, I kind of only think they get one of those next year. And then, you know, it's really just they're going to be late first round picks, Um, which whatever. My guess is that they had a very specific three, four guys on their board. Whereas like if one of these guys is here, we will take them. Otherwise, we're planning for free agency which i i don't love but if that's their plan at least it's a plan and it's something they're sticking to and trying to execute i think they still have um like about eight million or so in cap space that they need to clear up before they can uh sign Jalen brunson um don't quote me on that but i think it's something like that i don't know it's it's tough it's not how i love the draft to be approached um but obviously as two draft guys we like teams to draft players um because we think that's the better way to build but i i didn't love it i know our next contingent at no ceilings didn't love it but it seems like they at least have a plan which in the past they kind of haven't so i guess it's at least somewhat of a step in the right direction yeah after you reading all those protections (laughs) That sounds like a shit sandwich. Um, my goodness. Woo. Um, wow. But to make things better, they have four second round picks in 2024 as well. So, well, I'll, 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 I'll I agree. With you. you brought up the best point. I'm going to get away from negative town. Um, I'll, the best point you brought up is the Knicks might have had their board and they might have said, we're at 11. We want Johnny Davis. And he went 10th. And they said, we don't like anyone on our board. We we liked AJ Griffin. The medic, I'm just being hypothetical here. I'm not right. reporting anything. They might have said, hey, we like AJ Griffin. Our medical staff said no. Or we have a lot of concerns. Nope. Um, we like Duran and Mark Williams, but that's not what we want. Um and then they might have just said, like, we don't we don't want Jang because he's a long-term project and we need contributors now. We need to figure out a way to clear cap space. And that's when Detroit might have called and said, Hey, look, we'll get we'll take Kemba's contract. Just give us a first. Or or we'll give you a first and give us Kemba and give us the pick. You know what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm rattled after hearing those protections. <laughs> um so yeah, if they if they didn't love the board, I understand it. Um, yeah. it's just like, wow. But when you look at the board and, and players that went in that range, like I would have loved them to take Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, but it would have been a juicy like pick. Like if you mm-hmm. took him at 11, um, Duran, I still think a would have been great there, but like Duran, Mark Williams, AJ Griffin, Tari Eason, you can make an argument that any of those guys going at 11 would have been some reaches or some yeah. weird fits. And then the Knicks still would have been stuck with having to trade another $9 million contract or whatever Kemba's was. 
I get it. I'm I'm trying to be optimistic and upbeat for Knicks fans, but boy, I just want to hug all of them. I just want to give them one big hug and say we're going to be all right. Move on, Metcalf, I, or whatever you want to say. We can finish it off, but no, no. I, I just I think another team that really strictly adhered to their board was the Memphis Grizzlies, who yes. um, they were probably my least favorite draft of the night. Um, Interesting. I can't wait to hear why. Go ahead. It just felt like a big reach for me on both those guys. Less so on LaRavia. Uh, I, I I like LaRavia. I'm not sure I would have traded up for him, but if they were that dead set on him, and I think he would have probably gone in those next handful of picks. So they yes. probably traded up to the one spot that they knew that they needed to to get him. Um, so I, I, I don't hate that because that was kind of the general range or the start of the range where we had been hearing that he was probably going to, go so that that one kind of makes sense the david roddy one why and i th- this is going to sound more harsh on roddy than i mean it to because he's a really fun player um he's got a really unique offensive game with the shooting the physical bully ball inside i i just i i didn't get that one at all maxwell on the stream talked it out with me kind of understand what he was saying i kind of agree with it i think they're thinking with roddy we can hide his weaknesses and then if if he if he could work in that rotation he's a unique weapon compared to like other teams because i think they're gonna think like well we could put jaron jackson around him maybe um brandon clark kind of hide his weaknesses on the defensive side of the ball with I don't know it was very rich for me I was like whoa okay here's the curveball like here was the Santi Aldama shocker from the year before um because I love Roddy like he's me and you talk about his his feet all the time is just awesome to watch like he has some crazy footwork but when they took him I was like whoa like you you gotta have a specific plan for you're thinking like this will work with us and maybe metcalf is because they had so many picks they were like this is a worthy gamble where if it works with us and we can figure it out that's a unique weapon but i'm where i'm right there with you like i don't know i think laravia they traded up specifically to get in front of san antonio yeah i think they were like San Antonio's going to take them if we don't get ahead of them because they went right ahead of them. Um, go get your guy. They they found their guy. And, and even if it's a little early, we look back and we're like, LaRavia went a little early. That's still a playoff team that's saying, like, we need LaRavia to help us keep pushing forward. I I, I liked it. Um, I, the funniest is going back and trying to figure out Memphis's picks when you go on the wrong website because it's like <laughs> traded to traded. To, oh, uh, I love the Kennedy Chandler edition. I are, I think that could be one of their best picks. Yeah. So I, I guess what made me even more hesitant on the Roddy selection was the fact that they traded the Anthony Melton as that part of that deal. A, yes. And we're all pr- pretty much under the assumption that Tyus Jones is going to get paid an amount this year that Memphis will not be able to match or willing to match. Um, so then are they really going to go in at, with an undersized rookie as their backup point guard? That's the thing that gets a little interesting when you're heading into off season and, and because it's either you feel pretty dang good about Kennedy Chandler potentially being a rotation guy, or you're going to say, we're going to lose Tyus, but we might get a veteran as insurance to Kennedy. But I don't know. Maybe because this is what gets, you got to be really smart. Like when you start making that leap as a contender, then you run into this crossroads of like, do we overpay to keep, and I'm not downplaying Tyus Jones. I'm just saying, do you overpay to keep those guys because you know what you have? Or do you say we can get him in the draft? Like we're going to roll the dice with a second round guy filling his role. It's a worthy roll of dice. I think they're going to probably, I don't know. This is where free agency gets really fun because right. if you're Memphis, you're like, we can either be patient or we could try to 
figure this out. But I think Kennedy could be that. But I don't know. What about you, Metcalf? Do you think do you think they're really rolling the dice with this? Yeah, I, I think they're really underplaying how important Tyus was to that team last year and how much um he kind of elevated their bench unit and that overall kind of rotation when Ja was out. And I think going into a season with yeah, I, I, I like Kennedy Chandler. I think he's a really good player, but a six foot point guard as your backup, uh, I think that's really risky business and not ideal. Um, maybe they try to kind of maneuver Desmond Bain into playing a little more point or on ball stuff, or they just kind of go positionless and just have a bunch of wings out there and a lot of ball movement and pick and roll stuff when Jaws not on the floor. I, I don't know. It, it just, it didn't make a ton of sense roster construction wise for me. And I, I just don't see who Roddy necessarily gets minutes over or in place of, or who he defends. Um, and I, I just, I really didn't like the fact that they moved Melton to trade up for him. Melton seems like the move that's very underrated that we don't, realize until later like what's what's why do the grizzlies not look the same it's like because melton was more of an important piece than you realize and then if you lose tyus jones too it's like you really got to figure out a way to replace that i don't know it's fascinating um i think melton's a dang underrated player in this league and when philly got him i was like whoa i was like that's a little yeah, like nice move cool. for philly yeah i was i was shocked i was like that's a good value so it's going to be really interesting because I, I thought Memphis has been adding so much talent over the last couple drafts that I was like, they're going to, they're not taking three picks. They're got to try to right. trade package multiple to maybe walk away with two. And then they just keep adding these guys. And I'm like, well, okay. Are they just going to do like a, a hunger games, like survival of the fittest with the last couple draft classes? Like whoever sticks is, is going to be on our roster, but I don't know. It, it's those are the teams that get, more of my attention going into free agency than like the big spenders. Yeah. Like I'm fascinated to see what Memphis does to get a backup point. If they're not thinking Kennedy's their automatic solution, like what's the mentality there? I'm fascinated to see what Detroit does now, because maybe they're out of the eight and sweepstakes, but they're thinking we're going to go get something else instead. Um, I know miles bridges has been rumored there, but I don't know if I'm completely buying that, but we'll see. I, I, um, I don't know. I don't know my cap, but I, I'm with you that that was a quick one. Cause as much as I love Kennedy, it's like is that a big leap of faith for your belief in Kennedy. Like, Oh, this is our back. I was like, Whoa. Okay. Yeah. And uh, l- last thing I got Jane Hardy. Um, what, what are we thinking with your guy? Um, I, I was shocked that he fell that far, but I absolutely love where he ended up. I thought he ended up in a great spot. I thought he's going to be pissed off. He's going to be humbled. I'm not saying he needed to be. I'm just saying he's going to be like, all right, all right. I got to show everyone. I got to keep working. And um, he ain't going to be the guy. He's going to help the guy. And I think you even heard in his press conference, he's like, I'm, you know, my best asset is catch and shoot, shooting off the ball. And, you know, I'm hopefully catching passes from Luca and, and hitting threes. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what you're going to be doing that's the right mindset but he can shoot and luca needs guys around him and he can this is a second round guy that i thought he was still gonna go in the first but this is like i thought dallas could have taken him before they traded that pick for christian wood and they still got him at, at their pick and or they traded with sacramento but I loved it. Um, I thought it was a great fit. What else? We got some some rapid fires. We don't have to rush this one, Metcalf. I mean, we're having fun here. Come on. I um, thought Musa going to the Clippers was a pick that probably won't get enough attention. Yeah, I need. I I love that for him. Um, I, I think they're in a year or two. They're going to have some really nasty defensive lineups to throw out there, um, and they've had a pretty decent track record of kind of developing some of these second round talents that they invest in and, and undrafted guys like Terrence Mann, um, Amir coffee. They've, you know, he's grown into a place where he's sticking on a team. Um, so I, 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 I really like that for him. I think the, the defensive versatility he's going to show in 
a year or two is going to be astounding. He's just, he just needs to figure out what he needs to be doing while he's on the court. Um, I know that sounds like a lot, but I think he's also going to a coaching staff that has a really good track record of kind of showing guys how to best utilize what they need to do. Musa to the Clippers is like, uh, they're going to put him in the G league the first half of the year and then like bring him in after the all-star break. And then like the last 15 games, they're going to start playing him and he's going to show some stuff. And then all of a sudden it's going to be like, he's playing as the eighth guy and shows some flashes in the playoffs. And you're like, Whoa, what, what does the Clippers have here? I love that pick when they took him. I was like, Ooh, that's a good spot for everyone. Um, what else did you like besides Max Christie going to the Lakers, which I have to admit, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think it was a it was a good night for high school pedigree. Um, it was PBJ, uh, Watson, Houston, Christie. They all you know bunch of freshmen who had really disappointing years after being really highly touted high school recruits. All going top thirty five, and uh, Peyton Watson and PBJ landing in the first round and going to really good spots. I thought all four of those guys went to really good spots for them uh, in the long term. Yeah, I mean, Watson and PBJ have pretty much a big of a nightmare season as you possibly could have, and they go their top 30 picks. Um, Caleb Houston, nightmare year, 32nd. Um, Max Christie, you could argue, an inconsistent year compared yeah. to where we had him in the beginning of the year. 35th to the Lakers, I thought he ended up in a great spot for him. Um, there's value everywhere folks. And, and I think I was pumped for PBJ going to the Warriors. Like it was yeah. funny when they took him, I was like, well, they did it. Like, I was like, I, I, we were joking, projecting that trade. And then they did it. And I was like, awesome for him. Like, cause it, he's going to click. I already, he's going to shoot. Yeah. He's going to, at, at, at the very least, he's going to shoot. Those mechanics are too good. Um, and if they can kind of get anything else out of him, I think that's the place to do it. And I cannot wait two years from now to see who he is as a player. Wiseman's going to be good next year. And then they're going to have Kaminga, PBJ, Moody. <laughs> Shit. It's just going to uh, be another decade of them. Yeah. this another one. <laughs> Any Anyone else or what? I, I think that was it for me. What about you? I mean... I could talk about everyone all day. I, I love Ochai to the Cavs. Yep. I loved. Really um, like Dale and Terry to the Bulls, too. I did, too. I liked it a lot. I liked AJ Griffin to the Hawks because I think they're going to trade a bunch of people this offseason. Um, I loved Christian Brown to the Nuggets. I thought that was one of my favorite yeah. fits. Um, I thought the Spurs had a great night, Metcalf. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I know. I was down on Wesley all year, um, but I love taking that swing on him there, especially after getting Sohan and Branham earlier in the first. I, I think that's a great spot for him to develop his shot with Chip England um, and just get reps in the G League and be patient. I, I think he's going to be a good defender. It's what can he do with his shot and can he learn to be productive off ball? And I think that is arguably the best place for him to develop both of those skills. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you have been lower on him. We've talked about it plenty of times. Like you just said, I thought it was an awesome pick when they got him with their third first yeah. rounder. I was like, that's a great pick. That's worth it. That's exactly. And when we've said this before, but when we were lower on Wesley, it was just, we were hearing that he was getting like top 10 buzz and we were like, what is going on? And, and then, um, I loved where he went. I thought he went to a great place that's going to develop him to be a, a high caliber player. And um, I thought them getting Sohan was great. I, me and you were buzzing about that weeks ago. I don't need to pat ourselves on the back, but you know, it just made sense. It was a Spurs pick. And then yeah. um, I just love their drafts a lot. Um, getting Branham at 20 and, and it was a very old school Spurs draft where it was like, they let the board fall right into their hands and they jumped all over the value um so yeah that, that's all i got metcalf or else we'll talk for like three more hours so um let, real quick let's just speed round through some of these yeah. like the the late second round guys who we honestly we may never see um but i feel Don't like say we, should, we should at we, least we touch everyone. on um first i just Khalifa drop uh to the Cavs. 
real athletic. I really like the strides he's taken as yeah. a player the last two years. Uh, still really raw, though. Would be surprised if he came over this year. Me too. Um, I, I think that could be a little bit of development. He's got game. He's got some nastiness. He just needs some some run. He needs playing time. He needs. He's very raw. But there's some there's some fun tools. I thought it wasn't shocking that early, but I also thought like if if he's potentially a draft and stash guy, I thought that was like okay, get that one. Jop was a good draft and stash guy to target. Yeah, and maybe who knows? We'll see what happens in summer league. Maybe he goes crazy. Um, I, I really like the swing on Bryce McGowan's for the Hornets. Uh, I thought Keels to the Knicks made a lot of sense, and then just Ryan Rollins to the Warriors. Um, a, a team that's spending half a billion dollars just spent a few million to trade up into the second round for a guy. Um, I think Rollins to the Warriors could be the one we look back at on in a couple of years. McGowan's, I love that by Charlotte. Just get another talented guy with some crazy upside. I really like Denver getting Kamigate. I thought that was yeah. a great pick up from them. And then um I really I I I I didn't like him as a first rounder, but I did like the swing by the T Wolves to get my knot. Yeah. Um I thought him and, and the Pacers getting Kendall Brown where they got him. I thought that was great value for for both parties. Um yeah, I don't know. I, I, that's that's all I got. I don't want to talk about the Celtics, yeah. so let's leave this out of it. <laughs> Why not? Because I just convinced myself they were going to take Justin Lewis, and then they took JD, and I understood why they did it, but I just don't. <laughs> all right, man. Other than that, the, you know, the, the, fi- the final one that I, got I really to say liked. about that, <laughs> the final one that I really liked was uh, the Jabari Walker at 57 to the yes. Blazers. Um, I mean, he shot like 45% from three in the second half of the year. Um, after shooting like 20% from three, I think he's more of a, like a 37 ish percent three point shooter based on his high school track or his college track record. Um, I, I think that's an interesting kind of stretch for option for them down the line, but that that's it for me, Rucker. Yeah, Jabari was funny because I it got to like the Pelicans pick at 52. And I was just like, I saw Jabari's name flash on the screen. And I was like, what did my man have to do this year to get drafted? Like, I was just shocked because I was like, he had, game, he had like a stretch to end the season. Like you're talking about, where he was shooting the crap out of the ball from deep. And then he was rebounding like a monster. And then when our boy Schmitz comes up at 57. They took him. I was like, good for you, Jabari. I was just like, so pumped. I was like, he actually went to a place that he's got a shot. So, um, and I still think he's got some upside, but yeah, that's all I got. Metcalf. I, I, uh, I can't believe that it was just last week, the draft. Yeah. 2022 in the books. Um, some quick thoughts. What are you thinking happens? Uh, cause Free agency is coming up. What are you, what do you think happens? Give me some some predictions. Uh, Brunson to the Brunson to the next feels inevitable at this point. Um, I have no idea what DeAndre what's going to happen with DeAndre Ayton besides him not being on the Suns. Um, I don't know where are you at. Um, and then just if it if it like a Dejounte Murray trade happens, why the Spurs are apparently even entertaining that I don't necessarily understand. Uh, but I, I and if he wants to come up here to Minnesota, I, I'm definitely not saying no. The Dejounte Murray stuff. Did I say his name right? Now the guy who always calls me out for saying his name wrong is in my head. I, I, I'm just going to tell you you're right every time, even when you're wrong. No, but you can tell me I'm wrong now. Dejounte, Deon- it's not Deontay. No, I never Dejante. said it that way. Dejounte Murray. Dejounte Murray. Okay, I thought I said that a long time ago, but if, I'm probably going to get a DM tomorrow. <laughs> like you're still pronouncing it wrong, idiot. But no, I appreciate when people do that because I feel bad because I'm like, gosh, they're talking about 900 people. I I just have mistakes. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with Murray. I'm like you. I'm a little shocked. They're trying to move him. They must be trying to sell high. I also wonder if they're like creating a backup strategy if they don't get Aiton, where they're like, if we could pair him and Aiton together, awesome. If we lose out on Aiton, maybe we sell high. But um, I don't know. It may, 
I just thought he took such a leap next year. I'm like, but getting three first round picks, they, they, we never know what those picks might be. The Spurs might be like, yeah, you can have them for unprotected. <laughs> like they might be like, yeah, give us, you know, whatever. But um, he's funny because he keeps getting rumored with some teams that I'm like, I don't know if I love it. Like I get the idea of Atlanta, but do I love it? I don't. Because Trey needs that type of player next to him. But yeah. I just I just have, he, I, I have he, questions. Yeah. I have questions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I have similar questions. I, I don't know who I'm rooting for Aiden to go to. I have weird vibes that they might just be like, screw this. We're going to try to keep them. Um and just shock everyone. Something nuts going to happen. I feel like it's going to be some weird, complicated three-team deal or something that has pieces going all over the place. Um, what if he ended up in a place like Portland? Um, I mean, and, and like Nurkic was part of the sign and trade going back or something like that. That's my thing with Phoenix is I've had some buddies that are Suns fans that keep asking me like, what do you think? What do you think? And I'm like, well, then everyone will send me some questions of like, here's an idea. And I'm like, well, the Suns are in a risky place to like, they need to make sure that they make the right move with right. this. Because when you're giving up Aiden potentially in a signing trade, you're probably not going to get fair value, but you need to also get something in return that's going to help you be a good team still. Like, right. They're in a rough spot because. I still think people are going to probably write them off. I think the Suns are going to be pissed off and on the warpath next year, but they need to get, it's like you get like somehow two pieces for Aiton where it's like, you yeah, got they, they can't let him walk. No, like they, yes. if they let him walk for nothing, it is going to be a disaster. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I, I it, this is the time of the year where I just start pulling out everyone's roster and I'm like looking around like, okay, where, where, where where's the move? Where, what makes sense? What would be fun? I'm excited. The Kyrie stuff was hilarious. The last 48 <laughs> hours. I was like laughing like the Joker for 30 minutes. My fiance was like worried about me, but I was just like, this is the perfect just powder keg to start off the buzz for free agency. But I, I, I just hope that one day I can be brave enough to, agree to a $37 million contract is. Yeah. I mean the, the mid-level talk with Kyrie, I was Hilarious. like, yeah, he's going <laughs> to, he's going to pass up 29 million extra dollars to go play for somebody else. Yeah. Um, that's all I got my cap. I'm just cool. counting down the days till Vegas, but you know, I, it, for everyone listening, we all will be at summer league, but Metcalf's not going cause he's a real jerk. Well, my dickhead of a friend who I've known and been best friends with since I was five decided to have his wedding uh, that weekend and was even more selfish and asked me to be part of it. So I was like, well, he'll understand if you miss. I mean, it's summer league. Come on. <laughs> Rucker, this was a blast. It felt weird having a whole week between doing it. Uh, but this was this was a lot of fun. 2022 is in the books incredible first year for no ceilings the support the fans they've all been awesome uh please plug away tell the people where they can find you where they can support you yeah i'm I, um thanks for everyone listening throughout the year um we're still gonna be grinding me and metcalf on this pod because we love doing it too much but um i'm at tyler underscore rucker on twitter summer league's coming up um a big amount of us that will, from that no ceilings will be there we'll be doing a lot of content um podcasts live streams all that fun stuff so i'm excited for that um and thank you guys for your support we'll still be having stuff at no ceilings nba.com because you can only withstand uh the draft itch too long i i know finally we're gonna all get to a point where we're gonna be like should we open up the floodgates boys and, <laughs> and I, I already know that talk's gonna happen so i'm getting the itch i can imagine that after some downtime, we'll we'll all be getting itchy to get back into it. But thank you, Metcalf, for this year. Well, once again, I'm Tyler Metcalf. You can follow me on Twitter at tmetcalf11. You can find all of our merchandise at noceilingsnba.bigcartel.com. You can find all of our written work at noceilingsnba.com. While you're there, just hit that subscribe button. It's 100% free. Uh, and like Rucker said, we're going to keep having stuff going through Summer League and you know a little more sporadically, but still throughout the summer. Uh, just 
you know, as a sign of good faith, Maxwell posted about 6,000 words on undrafted guys there today. So make sure to go check that out. You can follow us on Twitter at No Ceilings NBA and on YouTube at No Ceilings TV. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and a five-star rating. Until next time, see you.